In today's episode, we're talking about monetizing your podcast. All right, what up, fam? Welcome back to Entrepreneur Hour Podcast and Entrepreneur Hour TV, where we create superhuman entrepreneurs. Today, we're gonna talk about a, t- a subject that has come up all the time, and me being and, ha- and ha- being a podcaster, and I hate, I don't always use that term. I always say I'm an entrepreneur with a podcast, but I'll go ahead and claim it, I'm gonna own it. I'm a podcaster. Uh, a lot of the questions that I get are, hey man, hey bro, how do I monetize my podcast? So stick around, that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna dive deep into that. That's all we're gonna talk about the entire hour is how to monetize or ways to monetize your podcast and kind of giving you the facts, like what's out there, what's the reality of it, what have you heard? We're gonna debunk some myths and I've got a special guest to do so with me today, Mr. Michael Greenberg. How are you, buddy? Welcome to the show. I'm doing great. I'm really happy to be here. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Man, I, I, sometimes I have guests that come on and they just like, their, their microphone just sounds so amazing that I'm like, damn, I got to up my game because his shit sounds better than mine. <laughs> you are definitely in that category. Your microphone sounds amazing. Thank you. Well, I'm using a Sennheiser E385 mm-hmm. with a blue icicle. I yeah, found- show, show, show the icicle. For those watching on YouTube, show the icicle. I didn't know this existed and tell everybody what this is. So this is my secret weapon and sure makes one as well. Um, that's a little more professional grade Mm -hmm. and it's an XLR to USB converter. So it takes XLR, which is the professional microphones that you see in studios and everywhere. That's the standard audio cable Mm. and converts it to USB. So you can use a much higher quality mic or much more specialized mic that might not be available with a direct USB connection. And so you don't lose any of the quality in that, that process of, of kind of transmitting that signal, so to speak, do you? I mean, I lose a little, but this is essentially a mini converter. Okay. Um, like, you know how they sell little, like, four-channel boxes now? Yeah, I saw that. Like, Rode has a new product like that, I think. Yeah, this is like a one-channel. Interesting. That's really cool, man. I like that a lot. It sounds fantastic. It really does. And I know XLR. So for those who don't know what that, the difference is, it's basically um, your XLR. It's like your, your input cable, right? It depends on how it's going to... So mine just is a USB. I plug directly into the side of my computer, but an XLR is a little bit different. It's like, it's like your traditional one prong that you see on the end of microphones. So usually you have to have, what do they call them? Sound tables or something like that. The little box you're talking about. Yeah, mixer or sound Mixer, board. sound, yeah. So you usually have to have something like that. But if you have this little converter thing that turns into USB, that sounds like an op- awesome option. And I'm assuming it's significantly cheaper too. Yeah, I mean, I think they maybe range from like 50 or 60 to 100 bucks. Oh, that's so, beautiful. That's worth it. To have an XLR mic, mic that's, like that's totally 80. worth it. So maybe 200 for the whole setup. You paid $80 for that microphone. I I think so. It might be less. It sounds tre- for an $80 microphone, man, it sounds tremendous. It really does. This is like the base level vocal mic yeah. uh, from Sennheiser. Yeah. Well, we were talking about that too. So we're going to jump into all kinds of talk on pod. We're going to focus on monetization, but obviously there's some things we're going to talk about right now. Um, but having a vocal, I've heard it been called a dynamic mic. I don't know if that's considered the same thing or not. Um, I have no idea, honestly. Um, but, but I know that pod. this is specifically for vocalists, for performers on stage yeah. where you might have a lot of other noise around. Yeah. So it has a very narrow capture and a very close one, mm. which means I have to keep the mic closer, uh, changes your mic work a little bit but gives you the added advantage of I live next to the highway and half the wall is glass. Yeah, yeah. That would get noisy. And a lot of people, you know, the biggest issue that I hear from a lot of people too, in line with monetization, which again, we're gonna get into, uh, is the reverb, the echo in their room, right? They spend all this money on these paddings and stuff like that. They look like they're building an insane asylum room in their home or something. Um, That, and then also, hey, like, my dog goes crazy or like your situation, I've got the highway. So having a microphone like that that's built specifically for voice, right, uh, is going to eliminate a lot of that. You have to be right in front of it. Now, if I back away, you know, it, you can tell pretty quickly that yeah. it, the, the sound quality. Oh, I can't hear you at all. And you're maybe but, what, three feet for those that are listening? Oh, maybe yeah. two. This, yeah. is, this is like one foot away. And then this is like right up with my lips next to it. Wow, so you have to be right on top of that thing. Yep. Wow, cool, man. Awesome, all right, so let's go ahead and get into to your background, right, kind of what led you. I'm curious to find out, because I, I know you've played in a lot of different verticals and spaces, you know, a lot of B2B, SaaS plays and stuff like that. Um, venture, it sounds like you guys, you guys raised uh, 
round of fund institutional funding and things of that nature. So it sounds like there's some other things going on. And then now there's this, you know, kind of emphasis on podcasting and working with podcasters to help them develop strategies and monetization routes and things of that nature. So um, kind of back up a little bit and then what led you into doing the work that you do and who are you? Yeah, so I am Michael Greenberg. Um, I like to call myself a gentleman of technology. Um, I'm a multi-generational entrepreneur on both sides of my family. So going back, you know, three, four generations, pretty much since the family came to the U.S. on both sides, people work for themselves. Um, Did you find that to be added pressure? So I had a lot of pressure to not go into entrepreneurship. Interesting. Um, that's because they know the reality is. of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, you can fail. Yeah. Professional careers, especially once your family has enough money to send you to school for that sort of thing, mm. are going to provide a much more stable income. Sure. Um, so I went against the family's advice, mm-hmm. dropped out of school, went to a coding boot camp did the startup thing, raised a little money, uh, and then stopped doing startups and focused on consulting, uh, B2B growth strategy, a little bit of fundraising for seed stage companies. Okay. Um, and uh, focused really, really on looking at SaaS and B2B service plays. Okay. Along the way, I got to work with a podcast network and a marketing agency simultaneously and saw a lot of the parallels in the content production work Mm -hmm. and that a few years later turned into call for content which is my podcasting agency today okay so you i'm trying to you know connect all the dots here so you didn't end up i know a lot of people have created what they do is hey i want to start a podcast they start a podcast and then they start to understand the ins and the outs of the podcast world and oftentimes it's pretty obvious, right? Like, oh my God, people aren't making money doing this and they're putting all this time and effort into it. Or, you know, oh my gosh, people don't know how to handle all the technical specifics of starting a podcast, right? So they start to, to realize kind of the opportunity in the space. So it sounds like that's not how your trajectory ended up where you didn't enter in, hey, I have a podcast. These are the problems. It was, hey, I want to enter into this because I was exposed to it in another way. Yeah, I have entered the podcasting space very purposefully. Um, I came into it from a background in podcasting that gave me insight into a highly profitable operation. Mm. So I thought of, I did not come in thinking podcasting was a place where you don't make money. Interesting. Um, I came in exclusively from a B2B background, which I think makes a huge difference. Podcasting is much more effective for business to business. It is. Um, it's a nature of the medium, both the depth and the niche audiences that it tends to build. And so when I came into podcasting with Call for Content, we started with podcasting as part of a B2B lead gen strategy. And then we've moved out from there. As we've learned how to do other parts of podcasting, we've started to offer those services to podcasters. Okay. Now, were you guys were you guys focused on creating inbound opportunities that people were searching and, dis- and, and for, as far as enhancing your discoverability, or no. were you guys doing it to to nurture already kind of built or previous relationships that you had established? Yeah, so nurturing relationships for content creation by repurposing the content from the podcast, right? And then for what Sweetfish Media has now coined as content based networking. Sure. But back in the day. I just called the warmest cold intro you could have (laughs) in the podcast yeah. um, and using it to generate either new partnerships or direct leads if the sale value was large enough. Now, where where did, okay, so where was your main focus then to generate new inbound opportunities to then nurture them with repurposed content like podcast audio? Yeah, so for the inbound, we were going to be using ads. Okay, used ads. We still do use ads. I love ads with content. Okay, so Google, Facebook ads, all the above? Uh, It depends on the audience. So based on the personas, that will tell you where you should be buying ads. Okay. Um, Give me an example of of an area where you would use a Google ad versus, uh, you know, a social media ad or YouTube ad or something like that. Yeah, so if I'm trying to hit 
like say bootstrap founders mm -hmm. uh so that's sassinate in digital agency mostly in that case mm -hmm. a quora ad might be one of the best bang for my buck interesting and then i might want my repurposing on facebook whereas if i'm going after a fortune 500 ceo mm -hmm. google is a potential option they, if they're searching for something very niche everybody mm -hmm. uses google mm -hmm. social is going to be pretty much useless for me and with the ceo types really yeah interesting they don't have time yeah if you're that busy um if you're that important you just don't have time to use social media and so then what we're looking for is they probably have one podcast or magazine and then we're looking at a very account-based approach. Okay, these 30 are very likely to be common HBR readers. And so if we want to actually make it in the door with them, then we have to get our client in there. How do we get our client in there? Well, the best agencies I know have a 30% success rate. Mm. So we need to have a really good story that's research-based and has a compelling thesis. Mm -hmm. If we're going after a part of that group that is a little more vocal, mm -hmm. so maybe not the Fortune 500, mm -hmm. but say 5,000, LinkedIn is probably going to be a great place for us to look. And we know for LinkedIn, we're going to need a five-figure ad spend because it's not cheap to play in those waters. Interesting. Now you're sending them, you're saying to what, like, I know you said to, to podcast audio, but is that embedded as like an epic blog piece of content that you're sending to as a landing page that has an embedded podcast? Or how, did, so, how are you guys doing that with that type of targeting on social or even on Google for that matter? Yeah, so again, it comes down to the audience. For somebody okay. like the CEOs, they're not gonna listen to a podcast. Okay, interesting. So we are writing blogs from the podcast episodes. Transcriptions are actually like writing unique content for it. Well, we'll take the transcription and repurpose it into unique content. Sure. Um, and then if we're looking for, like we have coaching clients and consulting clients, mm -hmm. where in those cases, we're going to be pushing to some sort of download where the email sequence is then tied into pushing to the podcast. Sure. So there's some and kind so, of a lead magnet associated with that piece of content. Yeah. And so we're not pushing directly to the podcast. We use the podcast content and we might use videos cut from the podcast or other right. clips right. Um, for the advertisements, but we don't want to push straight to the subscribe because we want to capture the email in between. Right. And I, I tell people this all the time, man. It, like, There are situations where I will personally send somebody from one content medium to another. So for example, uh, I found that I've had a pretty decent success. We just started a YouTube channel, it is ex extremely small. Um, but one of the things that I noticed is that I was pushing out like IGTV videos that were little snippets of my of, of my videos like we're doing here. Um, yeah. And just kind of just, just playing around with it. And I was picking up subscribers from it, right? Because they're seeing it, they're engaging with it, boom. One of the things that I wasn't seeing, just kind of looking at the analytic, analytics was, you know, pushing something out and saying, hey, there's more to learn on this blog that I created, blah, blah, blah. I, what, we weren't seeing a, a significant amount of click-through rate on that specific platform to my website. So we've really been using it to grow YouTube and the YouTube, the click-through rate on YouTube is ridiculous. I mean, it is high, 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 right? Like if you see a lot of click, we even make direct sales. We made significant amount of direct sales. I did, I guess it on my wife's channel because it's larger than mine. She's been doing it for like seven or eight years. And I was making like, I, I just created a, a basic intro offer. It was like $9. Dude, that thing took off. Just talking about, you know, teaching value-driven content with a, a mini course that I created, this nine bucks. And I was making sales like gangbusters from the minute that it was released up until right now, until I've started recording this. Um, so it just, a, like, I guess what you're saying and what I'm, I'm gonna emphasize is that I think it depends, but you always wanna try to be funneling down to the email list, not, Hey, come here and then subscribe to my podcast. Like, that's great. That's all well and good. You have a ton of, of subscribers, but now you don't have any money to pay your bills because you're so focused on subscribers and downloads, right? So I think those vanity metrics kind of cloud our judgment. Yeah. I mean, I'm a hardcore digital marketer mm -hmm. coming from the consulting end of it. Yeah. So the only thing I care about is where can I build real ROI and value? And I'm going to trim all the other fat out of what I'm trying to do. Right. Um, and I want an email list. 
if I'm doing digital, I want to build as big an email list as possible because yeah. people don't care about other stuff in the same way. Right. Okay. So, so I have this belief and maybe this is just me. Um, and this might be a little bit off topic, but I'm going to go with it that people are just, and you watch my video on, on, you know, YouTube versus it wasn't YouTube versus podcast. It was podcasting pros and cons. It was one of my, I think it was my last episode of the time recording this, yeah. but I said one of the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that you experience with audio. And you said that, like, I want to trim the fat, right? So one of the biggest issues that I've seen is people when they're listening to podcasts, they're doing something else, right? They're engaged with something else because it's convenient for me to just listen to a podcast while I'm walking my dog, while I'm making dinner, while I'm doing the trash, while I'm doing the dishes, like whatever, right? Like that's the perfect time to listen to a podcast. It's not the time for you to be grabbing my unique link in my show notes or my show description, right? And browse over and check out something that I'm offering, even if it sounds amazing, right? Or even if it's an affiliate that I mentioned, like driving for Uber, you might remember down the road that I said something about Uber, but you're not gonna come back and find my link because you probably were driving at the time that you heard me talk about it. So it's almost futile to a large degree. And I think some people get so fascinated and in, in invested in like, oh my God, I have to grow, grow, grow. And they're pitching their hearts out on their show and they're not making sales, not generating right revenue, right? Yeah, so, no, that is very common. So, so you know, that's why I like that you guys are using it in the same way that I use it as more of a nurture. We talked before we started recording, you guys try to use it as a nurture tactic. So when do you start using that? They join email list, right? You funnel them down, join email list. And then weekly, are you sending out podcast episodes to kind of continue nurturing and building that relationship, taking them from fans to super fans? So that again, very much depends on okay, depends. what we're trying to do. Yeah, We drop a lot of seasons these days just from a planning perspective, they're a lot easier to produce. Hmm. Um, and from a promotion perspective, they fit better into existing content calendars. Interesting. And so that's been a shift that we've started to work with. That's do you not lose interest successful. when you do, when you have long gaps like that with seasons and so versus uh, continuous evergreen content every week? We like to use seasons as part of a larger content strategy. Okay. They're not going to stand on their own in the same way. Interesting. Um, a season with a blogging strategy, we see real efficacy with mm. because the season replaces, say, an ebook. Yeah. Um, and the season gives us a lot of content for the blog at the same time. Sure. And so there's there's reasons why we would do a season, mm -hmm. but it would all we would always be having consistent content published. Interesting. And when you do a season, so it's isolated to whatever you're promoting for that specific person. Exactly. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. And that sort of season drop is going to really spike the downloads on it. Yeah. Which a lot of people like because then they can talk about high download numbers. Mm -hmm. And they're discovering it through the blog content. They're not discovering it likely through, let's say, Apple Podcasts at that point, correct? In that specific correct. example. We don't really use podcast um, SEO very much because mm -hmm. it's kind of a pain. Because it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got to do it for each platform. So as yeah. long as you make sure you're on Spotify and you're on Pod sure. Apple and you're on the others. And then our primary focus is trying to push any new audience to a website first. Interesting. And we, we generally do like specific URLs that can be shouted out for specific campaigns. Interesting. Now does that, so the slug is different or you actually have an entirely new URL, right? So like, so for example, um, I have a book club and I'm planning on doing a 30 day reading challenge every quarter, right? Because what that effectively does is you join my reading challenge and then I take you through kind of like what it's like to be a part of my book club, right? Like kind of the process, it's hundred percent free and I teach you kind of methodology or some kind of topic, right? Uh, yeah. What I'm doing now is power of habit. And at the end, you're going to get a little bit of a pitch to join, right? To join my book club or whatever. So the, the URL that I was using was a slug. It was chrismichaelharris.com forward slash challenge. But what I'm thinking about doing is getting learnwithcmh.com and then using that as the shout because that seems to be easier to remember than a slug. Would that be something you would advise? Yeah. Uh, we, for example, I've been on a lot of shows promoting my authority marketing playbook. Mm -hmm. I own authoritymarketingplaybook.com. Jeez. 
Nice. Um, I'm double checking. I'm pretty sh- certain I've got podcast monetization playbook.com for the same reason. Yeah. But if I don't, I have some other variation that I'll shout out by the end of this episode. Yeah. And, there's, uh, and people do that with their books all the time. Like Marie Forleo uh, just had everything is figureoutable.com, right? The, every, her book was everything is figureoutable, right? So you see people do it a lot. Authors do that a lot. Um, and I know the slug is easier and it's free, but dude, you can go get those URLs for pretty cheap. And it's so, I think people get caught up in the technical aspect of it, but it's so easy. What, what you're a developer, I'm not. What is it called? Pointing it to? Once you buy Forwarding. It? Forwarding, thank you. Yeah, so I've got my go so i turned out i had forgotten to set up the forwarding on podcast monetization playbook.com okay so i did just now it took four clicks after buying having bought the domain at some point in the past yeah super easy um yeah and and it's good to go there's nothing else has to be done as long as you know the url that you're sending it to you're forwarding it to it's done yeah and that makes a huge difference in your ctr interesting um when it comes to podcasting on podcasting it does just in all sorts of podcasting yeah. interesting interesting that's wow. how if you want to know how authors sell books on podcasts mm-hmm. that's one of the main reasons that they can interesting wow okay so let's talk about some of the and we've, we've really just jumped into the specifics and i'm glad i want to keep doing that because i like to have depth and i think a lot of people have asked a lot of questions so this gives them a lot to chew on maybe more so than they thought they were going to get already in the first 26 minutes of this discussion not even um but let's talk about some of the don'ts right we talked about which was by the way completely different that you guys are approaching it the way that you are because i'm running around producing two a week right uh yep. and so it I, I maybe in, in your eyes might be overdoing it, right? Um, Not quite. Okay. If you want to grow listenership, if that's your sure, primary if that's goal, your goal, then consistency and the number uh, per week is going to matter. Sure. The more you publish, the faster you'll grow. Sure. And, and, and kind of on the other end of that, uh, we use our direct podcast every week I'm nurturing my email list with new content and I'm giving them usually it's something that I feel like I need to teach. Uh, and then, so what I'll do is I'll write a pretty lengthy email about that specific topic, right? So value driven content in my email newsletter, then, Hey, if you want to watch or listen to this, boom, that's inserted there as well. Right. Um, so for us, it is that, it is that nurture over time. And usually we'll do that in between promotions, right? So it, it's, Hey, this is who I am top of mind create value, give value, give value, you know, kind of taking like a, a Seth Godin approach, right? Of like really be more of like a purist in your marketing. Um, and then when you get to the point where you're ready to promote, the, you know, this is the thing I don't like with people. And, and I want to make sure this is abundantly clear because I don't want them to take your advice the wrong way. A lot of people build an email list. They don't talk to them at all until it's time to promote. And then they're like, who the fuck is this? Like, I don't know who you are. Like, I've never, I joined your email list. I don't even remember that. That was a year ago. I haven't heard anything from you at all. And now all of a sudden you're promoting something. Right. So I think people go a little bit too far on either extremes with that. That's my opinion. Anyways, I don't know if you agree with that or not. Yeah. I mean, I'm probably, well, I'll say from experience, I will not spend any time writing a newsletter for a list under 300 people. Sure. Of course not. Right. Um, I want it to be in the mid hundreds before I spend any time on newsletters. But sure. after that point, yeah, I mean, I would probably agree that being said we have seen success with people just having really good promotion cycles sure and you know maybe having a four-week promotion cycle for something and then two weeks off in sight and going back and forth like that so no Mm -hmm. real newsletter just a lot of big ups and downs with promotion around interesting interesting okay so i was i was leaning in that direction what are some of the major don'ts that you see when you start working with somebody and maybe it's isolated to B2B or maybe it is a case by case basis, what are the the major don'ts that you see or misconceptions that people have when they're getting ready to start their podcast or they're early in their podcasting career? Yeah. So big common mistakes we see are spending too much money on production when you have no real content strategy. Yeah. It's really easy to spend 15 grand on having great audio 
but that doesn't matter if yeah. you have no good content. Right. Um, not promoting the show is a big one. Mm-hmm. That's very common. Having no repurposing strategy from the show, going back to content strategy. Mm-hmm. If you really want to grow a show or take full advantage of it, then you need to make sure that you are properly planning ahead in terms of what you're going to turn each show into from the mm-hmm. content because you can embed specific questions that you need answered for your blog into your interview if you know ahead of time that that blog is going to be produced. Mm. Um, not having a monetization plan at all. That's really common with shows. So having no way to turn what the show is doing into money. Yeah. Um, that's probably the most common one we see. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things that I mentioned when we got started was um, you know, I might use a certain piece of, you know, let's say I'm talking about, let's say I have five different content buckets, right? And every, everything I'm talking about let's say on social media, right? I have different things that I talk about, not everything I'm promoting. Uh, but one of them is going to be my main focus is my book club, right? So I'm going to talk about an educational piece from the book, from a book that I learned something about, and I'm going to plug my book club because that's what I was talking about. Right. So is that what you mean when you're saying having an idea of how you're going to promote what you're going to sell or what would that look like as you see it for somebody? What I, here, here's why I'm asking you this. Let me back up real quick. I don't want somebody to think that just because they drop their link in their intro bumper that that's they're promoting. Right. Like that's their monetization strategy, <laughs> because I think it needs to be a little more in depth than that. I think they need to take it, you know, even even treat sometimes some episodes um like, like, like kind of like a webinar, right? Like this is what I'm teaching you. This is what I, this is what I offer. This is how I do it, especially in the B2B space, right? Kind of showing off and flexing a little bit. Uh, yeah. that's not the and right word the per se. Space. Yeah. Right. And the, um, yeah, no, sure. I, I, I think flexing is not the wrong word. Okay. Um, part of what we do when we're building the first episodes for a client mm-hmm. is make sure we put case studies in. Sure. And those case study episodes are going to have retargeting set up. Mm-hmm. And that retargeting is going to be focused on selling the product that it's case studying. Right. Okay. And so we we like to see a business around the podcast because a podcast in itself can be a business. Yeah. But then you need a whole marketing plan for the podcast too. We work with podcast networks. The work we do for them is very different than the work we do for single shows. Interesting. In what way? Podcast networks need to grow audience in a very different way than shows do. Mm, because they're focused on advertising their monetization dollars? monetization channels are different. Okay. They know ads are part of their monetization. Okay. They know events are likely going to be part of their monetization. Okay. Uh, they're really focused on broader markets so they can find scalability in a way that smaller, you know, single host shows or really small networks of two, mm-hmm. three shows can operate very differently when they have that ability to stay very niche. Hmm. And so for big networks, even the way we look at them is as a bunch of small networks that are focused on a specific demographic. And so they've got the six shows that touch all of their interests. Hmm. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So what are some of the other things that you see then people are doing wrong? That was a good one. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, not promoting your show is a big one like social media isn't content promotion nine out of ten times Mm. i i don't care if you're posting about it but unless you're sticking a couple hours a week or more into dedicated growing your following and so that means when you're small on something like instagram sitting down and liking and following a lot of people so they follow you back and really boosting your numbers up Uh, so you have the reach you need that sort of thing takes effort Um, appearing on podcasts is a great way to talk about your podcast Mm -hmm. and get more podcast listeners because audio transitions to audio better than many other formats Mm -hmm. Uh, just like video transitions to video better yeah and these like having a promotion strategy is missing for most people and that's not just podcasters that's all content creators sure no i totally agree i think Um, youtube is even worse in many cases yeah 60 percent of content creation is promotion Hmm. 
And I think I think the big misconception a lot of people have, I'm glad you say that because I think the big, the big misconception people have is, well, I already said that, right? Because it feels, it's so unorthodox or it feels so, so against just our human nature or tendencies to like say things over and over and over and plug and plug. Like we think that everyone hears us, but in reality, no one heard us, right? And this was, I'll give an example. I'm gonna validate my statement that I just made. So I had been doing my show, and in some cases still to this day, still not as much because I've really gotten to the point where I'm promoting just um, shamefully <laughs> to a large degree. Yeah. Uh, because here's the deal. It, it assumes that everyone's paying attention and it assumes that everyone heard you, of which neither are true, right? And so here's the deal. After like two and a half years of doing my show, I would post something, right? Like I would have like a big guest. I think it was like a Barbara Corcoran or something like that that I published on, on social media, on Facebook. And I would have like close friends of mine be like, I didn't know you had a podcast. I'm like, bro, I've done 150 episodes. What are you talking about? You didn't know I had a podcast. So I think we, we, we interpret or we act as though we would act in real life. If you're the guy at the table that's telling the same story over and over and over again, right? Like you're kind of weird. It's like, why are you doing that? I had Laura Roder on the show and we were talking about how hard that is to overcome when you're talking about repurposing because it feels like you're saying the same things over and over again. But the reality of it is the internet is vast, right? And, and there are people out there that have never heard of you uh, or your message ever, right? And, and yep. you could say it a million times and you're still going to find people that have never heard that message before. And also furthermore, I, I had a, so I always like to think about not just how am I perceiving the world through my eyes, but how is the world perceiving me through their own eyes, right? And so think about it this way. When have I ever been upset with someone that I admire, right? A Brendan Burchard, or again, I mentioned a Marie Forleo for talking about something that I've heard her talk about before, right? I'm not, I've never been upset to hear Marie talk about Marie TV. I've never been upset to hear Brendan Burchard talk about his, his YouTube channel, right? Like I never, yeah. ever. So we assume that like, oh my God, people are gonna like us that here's promoting all the time. And it's like, dude, no, when have you ever done that yourself? And the people that do get upset with that, they're not the right people for you anyways. The people that do need your, your voice are gonna be like, yes, I needed that reminder. Thank you, this is why I follow you. This is why I love you, you know? Yeah, I mean, the way, I think to sum up my agreeance simply, um, when I look at a client's marketing, Mm -hmm. If I see nothing that could potentially turn me off, <laughs> then I know they're not doing a good job with their messaging because mm -hmm. I want polarization that is strong enough to make some people rabid fans and some people hate me. Yeah. Uh, now, where do you, where do you, where do you draw the line on that? Cause I know that's a, that's a concept that Russell Brunson talks about a lot with polarity, right? How uh, you can't be mainstream and vanilla. You've got to be, you got to have some degree of polarity, but not be extreme. Where do you draw the line or where do you recommend your clients draw the line with that? I know that's a really loaded question. question. There's no way you can answer that like directly, but you, no, that's you an personally problem. Okay. I will push them as far as they're willing to go. Okay. Wow. Because for most of my clients, they can go to the far end and mm. still make a million or two a year. Interesting. Right. Interesting. The world and the internet are, are vast places. Yeah. If you sell expensive things, you only need a few people to care. Yeah. Okay. And so for people that don't know what the hell we're talking about, we talk about polarity. Give an example maybe of what you mean by I'll push them as far as they're willing to go. What would that entail? Would that be just their core beliefs about their specific trade or, you know, their opinions about Donald Trump, right? Because they could be far reaching. Or both yeah maybe. i don't like to get outside the realm of the expertise i don't either because that's a bad decision it's a yeah. great way to show that you're not an expert in anything <laughs> by showing yeah. how badly you mistake your own expertise in one subject for transitioning yeah. over to another yeah um so yeah i i like to keep them within their realm but mm. we make sure that they publish contrarian opinions so if the big you know, a lot of people, I, there's been a lot of pushback in the past year or two about hustle. Oh, um, I hate that word at this point. Yeah. But there was a time when that was huge. Yeah. And at that time, that's when I was telling my clients, even the ones who are big on hustle, be like hustle, but fuck that. Yeah. Wait, can I curse on this show? Yeah, you're good. You're okay, good. Great. But fuck that. And 
actually be smart about it. Yes. No, and that hustles, that hustle, I think, I think there was an article that, that was on Medium called Hustle Porn. And it was, it had Gary V's face on it with a red X. And I felt kind of bad that Gary got blasted for it. But, um, but he's great at just pump up. A lot but, of his content is very pump up. He's a smart guy and he gives yes. great advice, but he also puts out a lot of, my favorite guy that I, to hate, to really uh, shit on for content production is Neil Patel. Okay. Because, I haven't heard that one before, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, I mean, he puts out his freshest, newest content is normally pretty okay. Uh huh. But then, because most of the stuff never gets updated, it's bad. Like, mm. a lot of it is just not great content. Yeah. And I think coming from his background, he, as a marketer, probably doesn't look over at all when it's written mm. under his name. Yeah, that's tough. I certainly don't for a lot of the content I put out. Right. And that, you know, that can dilute your brand over time. It's not an yeah. issue when you try to get a certain size, yeah. but it's part it's part of the dilution that occurs with that sort of polarity. Yeah. Well, well here's the deal too. You just mentioned Gary. I think there's a really valuable point to bring up here. Uh, for the people that that jive with that message, they need that message. They need that swift kick in the ass, right? For people that are out already crushing it, to use his words quite literally, that they don't need that message. They need to be more calculated and not kill themselves working 20 hours a day because they're already hustling and grinding, right? So I think it's to your point about there's millions of people out there. There's There are millions of people out there that need your specific message. And I think sometimes we just dilute that trying to appease everybody versus just being like, this is who I am. And I think the other thing too is when you are so convicted about something and you are building a podcast around a business, those are the people that want to do business with you because they have an alignment with what I feel to be a tribe that are like them, right? Seth Godin talks about people like us, right? And so if they can align themselves with you because you're not being vanilla and you're standing with your convictions, hey, I love this guy. I love that he stands for what he believes in. I don't agree with Grant Cardone to, in, a, in a lot of ways. And I've, Grant's been on my show. I love you, Grant. He's been on my show. But he everything to him is just work harder, work harder. Bro, I, like... I, I almost fucking killed myself working harder. Like that's not the answer for me, right? It's to be more strategic and that's fine. It's worked for him. Other people need that message, but I think some of his ideologies are antiquated. That's my opinion, right? So I think that there, and this is where you get into people thinking like, oh, this space is saturated. No, 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 no. Like there's never, there's only been one you, thus there's a market for what your message is, right? And that's, that's all you have to compare yourself to. But if you do try to be like everybody else, you're right. It is saturated. Yeah, uh, that's a very good way to put it. Um, I think in my experience, you can build a business, especially in B2B, on an audience size of 10,000. Interesting. 10,000 a month downloads? No, just 10,000 oh. total. Total downloads? No, well, or total, subscribers? None of those things. None of those things. Okay. So B2B, uh -huh. total potential audience size. Okay, I so see. From I see potential accounts perspective for your business whatever so so social media accounts email lists linkedin etc and downloads well, included when i say accounts i mean like businesses to sell to okay um so if there's if you get niche enough if you get targeted enough that there's only you know five thousand mm -hmm. potential clients i see if your average sales size is in the hundred thousand a year Mm -hmm. you're still good yeah you're good yeah you're good all right so we covered that uh any others that you see i know there's a lot of confusion around advertising people are like oh, i just need to get more downloads so i can get some some sponsors right I yeah, ads are never going to pay your bills right simple right so um, no, no, no nothing more to say on that then huh yeah like unless you have if you have ten thousand plus come talk to me and i'll tell you if you can make money with that because okay. there's a pretty good chance your audience is worthless. Interesting. And that's 10,000 downloads a month. They come talk to you. Otherwise not worth it. Yeah. yeah. Um, in B2B, you can get by with 2000 because you're working. Like if you have a niche B2B audience or a niche B2C audience of high value, mm -hmm. um, you can, you can find a sponsor for that audience and make some decent money with it. But it's okay. an integrated campaign. It's a real partnership. 
and it's not going to be just an ad sale. Yeah, I was going to say they're more performance driven. Can you convert things for them? And thus you might as well sell your own stuff at that point because you're going to take a pretty small piece of the pie. Um, Yeah, I mean, you might not want to sell your own stuff. Okay. uh, For any of a number of reasons. And Mm -hmm. if that's the case, there's an avenue there. Like I know of a couple networks that have built themselves Mm -hmm. on selling six-figure sponsorships for their shows before they launch interesting because they're very niche shows with very niche audiences um okay what would an example of one of those be so one of those is oil and gas okay they might you know if they get a hundred thousand downloads an episode that's fantastic but though that's going to be worldwide Mm. um and that that might be like every get oil they might have a show for oil and gas executives and every oil and gas executive listens to that show jesus that is super it's niche. A news show that interviews oil and gas executives that specialize in the permian basin which is one of the big oil and gas reserves in texas mm. and so that's a very niche topic show produced by for a very niche audience where they can get a large amount of money up front mm. because red wing boots who makes the boot that every guy on every oil rig uses is going to want to be there. And IBM with their Watson technology is going to want to be there both for the same audience. Interesting. And so they'll go, okay, so this is the part people are confused about. And maybe it's the exact same. People talk to me about, oh, affiliate sponsors. I'm like, dude, it was the easiest thing I've ever done. It took me five minutes. You just Google Uber affiliate program and there it is and you apply right now they have to approve you right they have to look at what you're trying to do and you have to send them links and stuff like that but for the most part it's it's way more simplistic than a lot of people make it out to be what you're talking about you know them paying a hundred thousand dollars before you even publish an episode how does that look in terms of sponsors your more traditional sponsors versus something like an affiliate marketing sponsor so that's coming and saying we have this existing audience Mm -hmm. or we have built audiences in the past Mm -hmm. and these are our projections with this amount of sponsorship on who we're going to reach over this time period okay this is the demographic we're targeting we see it is also your demographic and you spend money here okay Uh, would you be interested in spending some of that money with us to get a good deal on a new potential channel but is this happening via, or is this an email that you send out yeah, to, or do you need to have an, an existing email, relationship? This could be a call. Uh, this could be a LinkedIn message. This is us building a list of probably 20 or 30 different potential uh-huh. sponsors who would be uh-huh. good fits and who are spending money. Okay. And then reaching out on an individual basis to the correct brand manager or marketing manager or VP or CMO at each one. Are they going to want to see... Because obviously anybody could say, and people really wouldn't know, even if they're being honest, even if they're just bullshitting in the dark and shooting, you know, like, hey, yeah, I'm going to have 100,000 downloads. You know, like that sounds kind of like a wish, not a not an actual plan. Um, yeah, they have there, to see a track record. Okay, so there, there has to be some kind of track record. So I would imagine that in many cases, this can't be a new show. Or they have a sizable email list already from something else they've been doing and they're launching. Let's say uh, my buddy works at Dell, right? So let's say Dell launched a podcast. Uh, his was internal. It was like, to, you know, for company morale and stuff like that. But let's assume that it wasn't. Let's assume that it was outbound, right? The world was going to be able to listen to Dell's podcast. Dell is Dell, right? <laughs> like, yeah, they are who they are, right? And they have, they, have a, they have a lot of brand clout. So I would imagine in that situation, they could start a podcast, reach out, and many people would be like, hell yeah, it's Dell. They have that proven track record, right? So if you are a solo, you know, host, so to speak, probably not the avenue you'd want to go even if it was a potential opportunity because you're not going to have the track record right if you have those relationships you're not gonna have the track record they're probably not going to pay you anything because you have nothing to show for it exactly Uh, but here's an here's a rare example that we're working on that breaks that mold okay um it's a solo host show never done a podcast before very Mm -hmm. little social media presence but He owns a social media agency. He's Instagram verified. And, um, sorry, I just had to move that tape. Um, and he's interviewing professional athletes or former professional athletes. So people who have large followings already. That is a show that we can arrange for sponsorship to cover the production costs and maybe some of the advertising. Yeah. 
without too much of an issue. Right. Uh, because somebody will throw 20K at that. Um, monthly? No, just a one time 20K. Okay, one time 20K. Like, okay. That'll probably cover a quarter or so. Okay, that'll cover a quarter. Okay. And then you're back on the hunt for more, depending on how things go. And, you know, yeah. okay. Maybe okay. they re up. Maybe they say, hey, you guys didn't really show the growth that we expected. We're going to walk away. But now we've had a sponsor. We can talk about having had a sponsor. Yeah. And we have a market rate. Yeah. And you can put that on your website and say, we're sponsored by so and so. And that's huge brand credibility. For sure. Exactly. Now, that's okay. really how we leverage into others. Okay, so in that in that specific example, that's not a B two B play, right? That's just more of like basic general entertainment. It sounds like. So, yeah, but so, the work that we're doing, the sales we're doing, and the media work in terms of finding those sponsors, sure. media sales is B two B. Okay. And okay. Sure. That, sure. So we we understand that realm. Yeah, but I think that's so. What you're talking about, I think, is where people get caught up. Um, they have a show they want us to talk about their big Trekkies, right? So they want to talk about Star Trek. Yeah, and, that and show needs 10,000 plus before you can think about anything and you should not spend a dime on it until it's there. But, but is there any way, and is there any other way in those situations? And I don't know that I have anybody like that. I think most of my audience, they're entrepreneurs, right? And so they're here with a business and they're going to use their podcast, you know, not to build as a business. They're going to use it to build around their current business, right? Like that's, and I preach that all the time. So I'm glad you agree with me. And I'm glad that's been the results that you've seen as well. Yeah. I mean, that was experience. the first podcast production playbook we dropped was B2B podcast production. Got it. So, so well, let's say that there's a random straggler here that's listening that you know right now has uh that is a star trek fan or wants to create some kind of show that's built around they don't see let's just say this let's say there is a b2b play potentially they just don't see it right so so in that situation would you suggest for example let's go to this let's use let's keep around with the star trek example just for shits and giggles why not um what if they got onto teespring and created t-shirts that were like you know, little things that they say on the show or whatever. And they actually can create Canva has a new template where you can create t-shirt designs inside of Canva and you can actually have them made direct on Canva. It's pretty sweet. They're 20 bucks. So they're not cheap. You would definitely be better going to Teespring, but maybe there's ways that they can create that they don't see a monetization path because they're just pure creators, but they've kind of approached it like a hobby. So, you know, in those situations, I think that's where they kind of get confused. And they think the sponsorship is the only answer. I went to podcasts like outlier conference and there were a lot of people like that. And they're like, yo, yo, the advice you gave us was great, but I don't have a business. So what do I do if I'm just doing this because I enjoy Star Trek, right? So I was, I was trying to give them other examples. And that was one I thought of is sell some kind of merchandise, sell something like that, right? Or host a meetup where you charge people a nominal fee, right? Other ideas that they can have to monetize what they're doing so it's not just a hobby. Yeah, and we like to plan those from the start whenever possible. Um, okay. A lot, we find a lot of hobbyist shows are in a position where they're not going to be able, the host is unwilling to spend the money to get it to a level where it can be monetized in any form. Mm. And they end up in this, yeah, just this wasteland. Um, where you're stuck, you enjoy doing the show, but they started with some costs. They continue to have those costs incurred and they don't really have a way to grow large enough because they don't have the resources to put in. And yeah. resources can be time or money, but you, you need a plan to monetize from the start if you really want to make money from it and that plan can't be we're going to sell ads and i think you know sure i think a lot of people they say well we'll just kick it around and see what happens and it sounds like what you're saying that's the wrong way to approach it is you should not just say hey yeah we'll just start as a hobby and see where it goes but to really be a lot more concise and intentional about it yeah you start as a hobby you stay as a hobby All right um we help shows we, we call it going pro uh-huh um and it's not easy because to make the transitions not easy you mean why is yeah. that because they've already been firmly entrenched in this being a hobby mentally yep. or what yeah the people we see success with they start the show with like hey i have a career now and i want to go be a professional this whatever 
the podcast as part of my content plan to position myself with this thing. Mm. Those people have a clear plan in I want to be this thing at the end. I have a goal. The show is a vehicle to achieve it. But the show is the show is almost never a good idea as an end in itself. If you want to write a book, doing a show to interview all the subject matter experts for the book is a great way to promote the book at the same time. Mm -hmm. But if you just interview a bunch of subject matter experts and you've got no book at the end or no other way to turn that all into something cohesive, you're stuck. Yeah. Do you think part of it also training your audience as far as the expectations of what they get from your show because yeah. they've been in, because I think a lot of times, man, you talked about promotion before. I think another aspect of it too is they would love to support you. They just don't know that you do anything because you haven't talked about it. Right. And then all of a sudden you start talking about it. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like we've heard people, I bring that up because of this. We've had people where, um, you know, we start and then all of a sudden we start selling something. Right. Or, or no, not even that YouTube, for example, create YouTube. They join an email list. They get a promotion email they're like it's they're like shunning that person this is a few bad eggs right and most people are not this way but sometimes people will be like i really appreciate it when you were just putting out value like like the expectation is that you should just put stuff out for free that you shouldn't sell anything right and, and marie yeah. forleo talks about that i've mentioned her a couple times now she talks about people get really pissed at her when she sells b-school every february because they're so accustomed to marie tv just being free right so people get like almost repulsed and they're like oh i'll never listen to this again this was supposed to be free and blah, blah, blah. it's like i don't know why we have that expectation right but it, but sometimes people do have that expectation you have to retrain them and understand that they just don't get that right so so i would agree with what you're saying i think that's tough yeah i mean i come from technology we build apps that take your data and sell it for money mm-hmm. right you get free stuff you get the free stuff oh yeah selling it. yeah yeah what about patreon Eh. why yeah like i'm if you're gonna sell a subscription to your show just sell a subscription to your show but i write donations to charities Hmm. what do you mean by that what do you mean i mean i you're not gonna write donations to a content creator you do it to to charities is what you're saying yeah, if I want a content creator to put out content for me, yeah, I'm going to write them a check to literally create that content for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um directly. Yeah. That's I believe in I am a big fan of patronage, but mm. I believe in direct patronage for and, something, yeah. Yeah, and I don't really like the subscription model. Yeah. In the same way. That's a personal preference. I know some people succeed with it. Mm. But I think a lot of people think it's a great idea and they're really not set up to use it. It's just another way to sell a membership. Well, the other thing too, I, I'm, I'm a patron for um, for this awesome YouTube channel. Uh, and they have like almost, I was telling somebody this because one of my students was, was um, talking about how she was like, well, I could just get on Patreon, right? Because her content is kind of in that same vein of like, okay, but I, I don't sell anything directly from what I'm providing, but it, it might be good for me to build an audience that I would sell something directly at some point. That's kind of the, the, the methodology or the thought process there. Um, and I think one of the big things that there's a huge misconception about is the sheer figures that you have to have to get enough patrons on Patreon to kind of back in the same vein that we talked about before with advertising, with traditional advertisers, right? It's like these guys have almost, I, I want to say like 2.8 or 1.8 million. It's in the millions, whatever it is. And bro, they're struggling to get like 400 patrons. And the options are $1, $5, and like $30. And they're they're like really struggling. And they, they announced that to produce one of their episodes um, that cost them like $40,000. Because these are, these are, um, these are, I'm a big comic book fan. And these are like, you know, these live action renditions of like Wolverine versus Wonder Woman or whatever. And it's like really professionally done. And apparently it's highly expensive for them to produce these things. They've been doing it on their own nickel. And I saw, I was like, surely people are going to commit on, on Patreon because they have a raving fan base. And I looked and I, I became a patron and I looked and it was like 357 people. It's like, yeah. wow. I mean, I'd gate that content right off the bat right yeah. if i'm putting if you're putting five figures into your production costs yeah uh there should be some sort of gate um i mean i that sounds like the sort of group where in that case i would tell them hey here's half a dozen networks we work with pick the ones you like 
and we'll make the introductions because as in network podcast networks yeah do you believe in those i mean i work with them okay to give me the ins give me the give me the the pros and cons the ins and the outs of those because i've gotten pitched by a million of them and i've said no to all of them because i just feel like it's basically for people that they can't market themselves that's my interpretation tell me why i'm wrong yeah so some of them have good marketing operations okay um they can aggregate for media sales is the okay. big advantage they can lower production costs interesting those are the big things um, in what way in what way do they lower your production costs shared resources such as like equipment right so i can i personally can start a podcast network uh-huh. for call it maybe 50 grand a year because i can just hire that whole team in house uh-huh. and go acquire shows okay because to run a podcast network you need a digital marketer mm-hmm. you need a creative producer mm-hmm. who will also and then you need somebody to wrangle hosts and you need an audio guy sure yeah. so with those networks then do you, if i so let's say i joined a network would they handle a lot of the editing aspects of what i'm doing or would i still be responsible for that because i assume so they want to have super control network dependent um, okay podcasting is pretty much the wild west when it comes to network agreements right well, they seem relatively and, new like last five years or so yeah i mean there's there's no consistency in them mm. literally none there's no consistency in sponsorship arrangements yeah Only pm based ad sales have any sort of real consistency in monetization mm-hmm. so that's great for us because it gives us room to play but as a podcaster it means there's not really any sort of reliable best practice yeah. Yeah. Some of them had pitched me and they had a smaller following across all their networks than what I had myself. Yeah. Between... That, that's a red flag. Unless yeah. they're like brand new and they're coming from a very specific background. Yeah. Then like I know of a venture back network where they went from having like 30,000 or 50,000 downloads a month on their in-house shows. Uh-huh. And then they acquired a show with 150,000 downloads wow. a month. And wow. so they went from small to big. Interesting. Because they have a great production team who's done this before in other industries. Wow. And they raised money. So they do were you, new. Do you think that's the future? Is trending towards, you know, kind of like an out. To me, that feels very outdated. To me, this was it's my this was my interpretation. I said, you're taking something new and beautiful in, in, in this digital space that we now live in, and you're trying to cram it back in the radio box. That was my interpretation of it. Yeah, I mean, I think big media is a corrupting force in most mm-hmm. places that it goes. Yeah. But it will go into every form of media and exist. Podcasting simply lends itself better to niche audiences. Mm. Um, and so it is much more difficult for them to find success with the networks yeah yeah that makes sense because you know that is tough especially you know having a show where I talk about all these various things right like I'm probably a good fit for them but what, one of the things that we found is I might have 10 episodes in between an episode where it's somebody who's following is looking for let's say podcasting news or updates or teaching or what have you but it's been I'm, in the meantime i've talked about health and wellness and meditation and sales and email lists and everything like that you know what i mean so i've had to kind of like really focus on okay what am i going to be known for what do people come to me to listen for and i don't think people actually go through strategically and think about that but from a network yeah, standpoint don't. from a network they standpoint they don't want you to be that. super niche right so so you kind of have to make that decision about what am i going to be with this thing yeah and you know networks when we come in and we look at them like i mentioned before it's a very different process Mm -hmm. um when we look at individual shows we're looking to find one niche audience we can monetize with when we're looking for networks we're looking Mm -hmm. for generalized demographics we can build a community of shows around and capture as much of their time as possible sure now how many so i didn't ask you this when you were talking about the the size you said ten thousand accounts uh, is what somebody needs to create, you know, uh, uh, I don't know what revenue milestone you would use at that point. Are we talking six figures at that point? Are we, yeah, and like it would all be getting case. to mid six figures with that should be pretty simple. Okay, it's a well, 10,000. I'm mean, grind. All right. Uh, what, what have you seen to be, again, I know this is all case by case, man. Um, but I think people's expectations, right? So you have, you have two ends of the spectrum. 
you have people that think that they should monetize immediately, right? And like, hey, like I need to, if I'm not making 10 grand, you know, by the first month, uh, I'm done with this, right? Like I'm not gonna pursue it. And then you have people on the other end that are martyrs, right? They're just, okay, well at some point that light bulb's gonna, 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 you know, turn on, right? The light's gonna switch and I'm gonna start making money and monetizing this thing. Um, and so maybe they're not being as strategic as they need to be or they're not waiting as long on the other end, like I said. So what do you think is a, a normal expectation for somebody to have? Is it a year? Is it to figure out what their audience really wants? Is it they should come out of the gates and at least be making something? What should be some expectations as far as monetization? Yeah, so if you do your research properly up front, mm -hmm. um, you should have a pretty good idea of a monetization opportunity that can pay the bills and is viable within mm -hmm. the first 90 to 180 days. It, that's fast. Um, it's going to have to come from the people that you interview. Not you leveraging their, their leveraging the size of their audience. Yeah, or leveraging their personal connections okay. or targeting them as your leads for the business. Which is a thing that nobody talks about, but that's one of the biggest things that I've benefited from with the show is that is a networking power tool for me is what do I need, who I need to contact and who's that key person that I need to speak with and they come on my show and there you go. Which I know, by the way, is what you guys are doing too, by, by the way, right now. Because you guys pitch me and then you're like, I want to come on my show. So I know that's what you guys are doing. So kudos to you because that's smart, right? Build a relationship, come on my show, and let's talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I appear on a lot of shows. Uh, we, we run a lot of networking campaigns and we network with content almost exclusively. Mm. Uh, so we like to reach out with that sort of value first approach. Yeah, um, smart, smart. Interviewing people on podcasts works. And if... You know, if you can target that audience well and invite them on your show and, you know, you know how to qualify very well before inviting them on mm -hmm. and then you ask the right questions on air, you can get to like a 10 or 20 percent conversation rate afterwards. Yeah, it's, that's tremendous. Yeah. And, you know, those can be very high quality conversations. Yeah. For a consulting business or some other or a coaching business, some business where you can get that a uh, five-figure average client value, uh -huh. you can build that six-figure business in a year. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I would say my cold outreach, not that you asked, but I'll tell you, um, with the guests that I've had, because that's the biggest thing we leverage is the name clout of the guests we've had, I would yeah. say I'm well over 80% of, you know, conversion. Cold. Yeah. Right. I mean, we see fantastic rates. Yeah, unbelievable. So, I mean, in, in, what, in what capacity could you tell me I could get a B2B intro to someone in an hour of their time at an 80% conversion rate. That's unheard of. And that's why we use podcasts. Yeah. That's yeah. where I started and, with them, right? And the thing is, I don't, and, 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 and that will validate and justify me never selling anything on the show itself. Because if I can make direct sales, again, using the podcast to make sales, not using it as a business, it justifies itself 10 times over. The relationships that I've built pay for everything that I've done and then some by like 10 over. Yeah. The way I like to think of it is podcasts are great social capital generators. Yeah. But they're very bad financial capital generators. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I got to let you go because we're out of time here. But on the flip side, so let's say, you know, you did mention before that if somebody, uh, they are not in that space, they've been doing it for three years, they didn't start off on the right foot and they missed their 90 day window where they could have been doing the right things and working with you guys to do that. Uh, what are some steps you recommend? Is it go back to the drawing board? Is it rebrand a new show? I know a lot of people are frustrated and they're like, well, maybe I should just start a new show with a new name. Are you opposed to that? What would you do right now if you were in their shoes? We, so we do what's called, when shows come to us in the, this position, we do what's called it. ARV, audience research and valuation, mm -hmm. where we go in, we do demographic research on the audience. We look for topics that they like more and we try to build personas. We try to build those profiles of who's listening. Sure. We try to do direct interviews whenever possible. Mm -hmm. um, and we look to see, can we turn this into a group that we can monetize? If the answer is no, which in many cases it is no, 
then we say, okay, what is the topic of the show and can we reposition the show or reposition the people we have on the show mm. so that we can use this show for whatever your other business is. Interesting. And if you do not have that other business, can we sell coaching or consulting as our number one off of this? Mm. If not, then we're kind of in a quagmire. Okay. So people come on, you know, let's say they're a coach, they come on, you could still use those old interviews displayed on the website uh, to show some kind of brand clout to where they're incentivized. It's almost like um, as seen in, right? And you put Forbes and blah, 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 kind of using it in that to level up your own brand clout in relation to their their brand clout in addition to providing value driven content. Yep. And we'll probably take a look at the backlog and take a look at where the host wants to go within their own career. Yeah. Um, and we'll probably say, okay, you've got enough episodes. If they've been doing it for two or three years, yeah, they've got enough episodes where we can say, okay, you've got a book on this topic here. So, so let's I'm, get this out and jump you off. So I'm not the expert. That's why I wanted to ask you, but, but this was my thinking. I've played in the offline space as have you, right? Well, to a degree, right? Not, not in the content creation space. Let's put it that way. Um, cause everything in this day and age, there's no such thing as an offline business. Everybody's online in some capacity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so content creation space, the thing I love the most about it is you can repurpose anything, right? There's no, there's no such thing as a lost cause. I was in a service-based business and if we botched a $50,000 or even a hundred, you know, $200,000 contract, there's no like reuse that, right? It's learn so we don't make this mistake again, right? Yeah. But but in, in the content space, it's like, okay, this, this piece of content didn't work in the way that I thought it was going to, right? So how can I now repurpose it? Can I put it on epic blog content? Can I repurpose it on social media in a different capacity than what I thought, right? Can I put it in premiered on my website? Can I, like, there's every single thing you create is an asset that can serve you in some way. It's just a matter of figuring out how it's going to serve you. Am I wrong in saying that? I do not think you are. Okay. Um, but I would add one additional point to that. Okay. That some content cannot serve you for your current goals. Sure. 100% agree. And that, that you need clear enough goals that you can make that distinction to be mm. able to repurpose effectively. Okay. And that's diving into the analytics and seeing like, this is getting a lot of, you know, if you create a blog, this is getting a lot of hits. What can we do? to create more content like this or to boost up even further this content that's performing well because we know this is what people want to hear about or want to learn about. Yeah. So for example, we had a client come to us who had a show who was a former police officer mm -hmm. and they started to get away from police work and criminology in their show Interesting. and downloads were starting to drop mm -hmm. because their audience really cared about that very specific thing. Interesting. Um, and they tried to move their business into coaching entrepreneurs at the same time. While and talking about criminology, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> um, there's actually a, a lot weird of crossover pivot. with the okay. psychology. Okay, cool. Um, this sounds like a weird pivot. Yeah, there's there's a lot of crossover, but it wasn't. There was the positioning was not there. Mm. They needed that transition point that, and. It, they needed to create content to help them walk through that. They weren't in a place to do that. And the coaching practice refocused back on people in law enforcement. Yeah. And that worked out. Wow. Interesting, man. So I, the best decisions are made in numbers. So I'm glad you're validating that because sometimes you just have to have your finger to the pulse of what people are vibing with. And you've got the data to do that. Not as much on podcasting as I'd like. I like more data than what I see and what I'm given. Um, yeah, but, but we work oh, hard to scrape what we can. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Um, but man, if you're just even just a broad strokes looking at your downloads based on the topics that you talk about, the titles, the, the way you structure it, all of those things matter. So you have to test and keep refining and keep analyzing those things. So I'm glad you validated that, man, because I think a lot of people just don't do that. They just keep running in that hamster wheel, right? We talked about the, the bad thing about hustling. Hustle mode keep, puts the blinders up and you don't see things for what they are. And sometimes those three hours of perspective work and just taking a step back and looking at things objectively creates, then you get back to hustle, creates that velocity in that right direction you're looking for. So look at that, tied it all together, man. Uh, let's talk about call for content, which is your business. Where can people go learn more about what you guys do? I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people that are listening like, dude, I don't know half of what this guy was talking about, but I need help. So where can they go to learn more about what you guys do and how you can help them? 
Yeah, so you can go to callforcontent.com, C-A-L-L-F-O-R-C-O-N-T-E-N-T, and it talks about all the different stuff we do. We do everything with podcasts, uh, from creating them to producing them and monetizing them to helping get people placed on them. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we used to be a b2b content marketing agency so we still do a lot of stuff in the background with that cool. and our flagship program the first one i launched called authority marketing was mm-hmm. positioning people as authorities in very niche topics for coaching and consulting which is why i brought it up a lot during the episode awesome. um, that is call for content in a nutshell it's got a great team um, I actually, as of this year, have stepped down from being the CEO of the company. I'm happy to say that I've got a team in place that can manage it without me. Mm, um, but you. all the strategies are still there, the ones I made, and I keep a close pulse on those awesome. uh, since that is the core of our work. That's why you hire an agency. Uh, our playbooks walk you through pretty much everything we do. Okay. So if you book a call with the team, and it turns out you're not in price range, we'll just give you the playbooks to do it yourself. Got it. And the playbooks, they can go, they can get those on your website, or is that after a console where they kind of figure out where things are with what oh, they're doing? they're all on the website. Perfect. If you just callforcontent.com, uh, you can find the playbooks there. Callforcontent.com slash playbooks, authoritymarketingplaybook.com, uh, podcast monetization playbook.com three other urls that i'm forgetting right now all good Uh, yeah that's call for content the podcasting agency it's a lot of fun sweet Uh, yeah that's business number one Uh, sometime hopefully you'll be you'll let me come back to talk about south africa talent which is the new one this year sounds interesting (laughs) All right, man. Well, I appreciate you taking time to join me. I know we got to let you go. We are at our exact stopping point. Uh, so I'll let you go. But thanks so much for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom with my audience. Hope you guys got a lot of value out of that. A lot more that we could have talked about. And maybe we will have a second go around. We can talk more about that specifically and other interests that you have, Michael. But thanks so much. Wish you all the best. And we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thank you. See you, buddy. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in to Entrepreneur Hour TV and Entrepreneur Hour Podcast. Make sure to check all of our links below. Like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and share with a friend. Drop your comments below, and I'll see you guys in the next one.